Is that is that what kids do with cotton? They throw bowls at each other. <laughs> yeah. I like cotton too. Well guys, we are here with the cotton and we've managed to find a couple of people that actually know what they're talking about. So we've got Callum here and Tony. They're the agronomists that are holding our hands as we <laughs> try this venture after 25 years. Is that is that about right? Sounds good, mate. <laughs> Sounds good. So what, uh, yeah, well actually I should say that I was busy spraying and um, I got the call from Dad who was driving past and said, Quick, they're there. Quick, jump off, go down, interview them. So there's some poachers in the paddock. <laughs> yeah. So that's um yeah, it worked out well actually. I get to stretch my legs. So what do we got here? What's the general gist? We've just been bluffing our way through, pretending we know what we're talking about, no, updating no. the people. Uh, you guys have done a good job. <laughs> so pretty well from the start, you had a, a well prepared paddock, nice stubble paddock, good moisture stored, um, good nutrition in the paddock, plenty of nitrogen and. And then uh, contractor might come in and plant it. I don't know how much you've covered in these clips, but might come and planted it. We got most of the seeds up. It did dry out a bit and then it rained, so it, it, um, it's got a little bit patchy in places. But overall, we've got a good stand. And then it was just in the hands of, of what rain we got for the season. So mm. we'll grow an average, like a, we'll grow a reasonable crop just on stored moisture, but we really need that bit of in-crop rain to help it along. Mm. This paddock has had that. Not always when you wanted it, but it got a big chunk there at once and uh, it got some water ran off from a neighbour that had a big <laughs> chunk of rain, so it's yeah. had a bit of everything. Had a bit of, um, yeah, a bit of possible residual damage to begin with and then... Yeah, a little bit of herbicide check from that rain. And then we got water logging for a bit and then we got a bit of dry for a bit. So I think the start of January it was waterlogged and then it didn't rain for about six weeks, did it? Mm, so it, mm. it was plenty, plenty warm. That's when it really got its... its um, work clothes on and, and hooked in and set mm. a lot of fruit uh, and to give you a little summary of what's going on here in the paddock these are two plants i've plucked out from they're about two meters apart in the paddock yeah right so this one is about an 18 20 node plant so it's like we count the nodes from the bottom so we've got it's basically per branch so one two three four five six etc up to the top we always map the cotton plant it's very easy to read a cotton plant from what's going on with its structure the distance between those nodes tells you how well it's grown or if it's had a cold shock or something else and this plant's telling me it's finished like it's it's put as much fruit as it could on early it's cut out early at 18 nodes so it was some of the cotton that probably got cut out by that water long event in mm. january it filled what it had on when it got really hot it threw its top fruit off and then it's just been ticking away for the last sort of month and a half filling all that cotton so I haven't actually pulled a leaf off that. It is that's sitting in the paddock like that. So it's <laughs> it's so finished that it started to defoliate itself. Yeah. All the bowls are open to the top pretty well. One there that's cracked. He'll be open the next few days. He's so that's still the green. Stages, isn't it? So you got that. That's your bowl. That's a green bowl. And that's then that's, filling, that's what that's we're all after. Got the, got the spider's web material compacted in it. Yeah. And here's your. And then yeah. There's a cotton bowl. That's just one lock of cotton. And if I tease that out, you'll see that in that lock, there's probably um, eight or nine seeds. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's usually about nine seeds per lock. Then if we pull that cotton off the seed, which is what the gin does, so that cotton from there to there, that's what we're growing it for. So that cotton will usually be from the knuckle or the crease in your finger, it'll wrap down over the end and that'll be over an inch long, it'll be something like 34, 30 seconds of an inch. Yeah. And what we're trying to do in the paddock is just finish the crop in a way that that fibre is all good quality. So it, the fibre length as it grows off that seed, it elongates first and then it thickens second. So we've got to give it time to do all that. So to give you a look at this plant, so that's a, that's a fully mature plant ready to defoliate. I think we did one insecticide, maybe two in this crop. I can't exactly remember, but yeah, it's pretty low, low input crop. We put some foliar fert on it early to get it away. This plant is still doing a bit of work. So this is why we haven't defoliated the paddock yet. If you look out over the paddock, you can see some green and some white areas. So we're just managing the paddock for, to make sure all the cotton's mature. So you can see that, that bowl's mature and it's opened. It's a little bit ratty, but 
it's ready to go. And if we go up node by node, that bowl's cracked, so it's mature. And then the next four nodes should be mature. So one, two, three, four. So that bowl, if we cut it open, will have mature seed in it. And we've got one node, two nodes left above that. So he'll be immature, that, that bowl. Yeah. And I'll give you a look at that with a knife. That's the other thing we do when we're going through. We, we cut them open. So, so I we did count tell, the I nodes did tell to Tony check. to um, pretend that he's talking to people that have no idea about cotton, because I said that's exactly what he's doing with us. So, <laughs> so all you got all you got to think about is that white stuff turns into a pair of jeans. Yeah, yeah. Yes, just add a bit of dye, and we're done. just in the in the job of growing jeans, really. <laughs> so if you cut that bowl open, very careful to cut towards no digits, or you'll <laughs> yeah. lose them. So that's the one I said would be mature, and it's pretty well right. It's just a tiny bit of jelly in that seed, but most of those seeds are mature with a good outline on them. And then this fella will be a bit immature, the one that was right up the top. He just cuts straight through and he's juicy. Because mm. apparently pigs love them, don't they? That's exactly what a pig loves. That's bit, like a uh, big lollipop. Yeah, big lollipop for them. We haven't, we've had a bit of, a few, yeah, a couple of mobs running around in here, haven't we? But it doesn't look like they've done too much, but. No, they've been mostly coming off the creek. So if we look at the main stem of the cotton plant, that's, you can see it's set bowls up this main stem and then it's also loaded up some bowls on a side stem. So again, if we go up to where the mature bowls are, you cut that top bowl. We're, we're getting pretty close to maturity of the whole crop. The other thing I'll point out is, see those really long side roots? They're the ones that are going out into the skip mm. row. So that's why we grow it as a skip row. So the plant in the soil that it's grown in here with its tap root and close roots, it empties that profile of soil out of moisture and it hasn't finished growing and that's why we put it in a skip row so it then grows these roots out the side, mm. uses the moisture between the rows and, yeah, and, I guess and a, is able to finish. A good way of just showing you how big that is and how it actually works is can you see the cracks in here? You can sort of see them. Because people aren't used to cracking soils I guess, a lot of people, but you can see a crack here. We have, have had recent rain, there's a crack that's coming all the way down to here and often you'll see that the moisture's been taken out of right in the middle, eh? So if you think yeah. about that plant being in the row there, it's, yeah, the roots yes. are growing out. Well, that one's root snapped off too, so yeah, that can quite yeah, easily it's cover probably that, coming eh? right out to the middle. That's crazy. Once they get cracking, they can grow like, I think it's two centimetres a day, those lateral roots, they yeah, can right. pump them out pretty quick. <laughs> That's that so. top bowl. Yep. It's, it's close, but not quite mature, so it's a little bit of jelly in those seeds. The outline of the seed's got a bit of colour about it. Uh, to compare that, oh, here we go, I've got one that I okay. cut earlier. He's close. These ones are obviously fully mature and out. Mm. Have a look at that one, mate, it's got five locks. One, two, three, four, five. That's, Is that like a four leaf clover? That's a, yeah, like most of the bowls you're looking at have got four. Uh, up the top of the plant, one, two, three, four, but occasionally we'll get a five. There's probably more five lock bowls down the bottom of the plant. Yes, and then, so once that's defoliated in what, we've probably got another... So we might hit this, say, early next week. Yep. We'll uh, give it its first defoliant. Yep. We've got it, we're competing, uh, we've got a few things going on here. The plant's almost died back and thrown leaf off, but then because we've had some recent rain, it's also now trying to regrow. <laughs> If we let that go too far, it's going to be very hard to defoliate. And with the def uh, very, very, very little I know, with the defoliating, there's sort of two things you're trying to do. One's drop the leaf off or curl up the leaf and drop it yep. off. Is that, yep. is that right? Spot on. And the other one is to um, open up. Just mature the bowl. Yeah, just to open up the bowl and you want them to drop off. You don't want you don't want all the little bits hanging off the cotton, do you? The, the least amount that's actually attached to the cotton, the better it is for picking, isn't it? Get yeah, the rubbish that's out right. Of it. So both hormones that we use are plant hormones that are, are naturally found and you can see there's a little break in that leaf just like the autumn leaves that you might see where the leaves go red or, or brown and then drop off in the autumn for the winter. It's exactly the same process. So there's what's called an obsession layer just at the base of that leaf. We're putting a hormone on the leaf that, that increases the likelihood or, or actually makes that obsession layer form and then the leaf just drops off. The other one is uh, the bowl ripener we talked about. It's called ethophon, which is a synthetic form of ethylene, which is a natural plant ripening hormone. So 
again we're just going to ripen that so that it matures cracks open as it cracks open this outside shell just curls right back and dries and then obviously we've got a full open fluffy bowl now we could pick or strip that cotton because it's nice and fluffy a picker will come through and twist that off yep a, a, a stripper will come through and hit it off and catch it yep so that's the, the two different ways of so I was just about to ask that of harvesting cotton in the end you want to have either a round module or a big square usually it's a round wrapped in the paddock full of compressed cotton basically mm, and that because you get docked for trash so yeah, you don't want to have least amount leaf in there you definitely don't have green leaf in there it can stain the cotton dry leaf you can get docked for a bit of pin trash um, so we'll try and get all that leaf off there mm. open all the bowls and I'd say in about three four weeks you'll have a have a stripper in here yeah right it's about a month away so what's the, today is the 16th of April so to so maybe mid May second second week of May yep I reckon we'll have some machinery in here cool and what are we what are we sort of thinking it's been about what we've we've thought all along or it's a bit of a surprise as far as what we've probably aimed for an average crop here west of the highway be 2.6 2.7 east of the highway about 3.3 bales to the hectare so when i say bales i mean uh, a 500 pound or a 227 kilo bale of just the lint no seed so that's after the gin's done after it's thing. been through yep. the gin yeah yep. so that's what we get paid for we get paid a little bit for the seed and then we mostly get paid for that lint in mm. a bale so we were aiming with a full profile at the start of the season. We were aiming for an average crop east of the highway, so we're looking at maybe 3.3. I think we've surpassed that. We'll have to wait and see. You never really know until you get the... <laughs> As Phil said the other day, we'll just all wait, in there. Yeah, wait until the lie detector gets in there. That's exactly right. Because <laughs> I can tell you whatever you want to hear, yeah. and it doesn't matter. It's actually what hits the bank account. That well, matters. and it's hard too. Like, as we said before, we had, what, down there, we had it sitting in water for, I don't know, a good while yeah two three weeks all through it places. um yep. and then but we've had some bits that are a bit higher so they've drained okay and still they've, able to access the moisture they've then probably got, been a bit heat stressed quicker yeah. than the stuff that was waterlogged yeah so it's sort of yeah you just never yeah it's very i did we did say we have to go to a better part of the paddock not the thin parts so we're in an average part here <laughs> yeah right. And, and this looks like three bales so if we yep. we've got some better we've got some worse so we'll see how it comes out i think yeah, you know, there's definitely some four plus bale cotton in here. It's just a matter of where it mm. averages out. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're just very grateful we get to play with these beautiful heavy soils and the and a bit of rain, and mm. we can get a plant up and away. We can usually put something on it. Well, it's something I think um, even just from some comments and that I've we've had is it's very um, unique. This area in that you can plant summer or winter crops like that's not overly common in the world. No. So, no. you know we we haven't traditionally grown summer crops for different reasons but um it is it's a very yeah it's worth a lot to have that option there's a good crack mate yeah that one was pretty open yes so all that we got 60 mil of rain over three days and it still didn't still didn't seal them all the way up but it's um yeah no it's just good it's oh i remember as a kid i would have been probably yeah what maybe six we were cotton chipping on christmas day I think that was more of a lesson Dad was trying to teach us, rather than work pra practically. But <laughs> yeah, but yeah, just going around, seeing the bowls, playing with them, cut like cutting them open and all of that. But yeah, so it's been I've never really been near a cotton plant since, so <laughs> it's kind of kind of cool. Cal, I'll get you to jump in, mate, as well, because you've yep. been involved in this crop. Better give him the, I'll give give you the microphone. I'll give you the microphone. Yeah, with the with the picks, where I suppose yeah, when the plant is growing. We're watching it and we're, we're checking the internodes when, when we're plant mapping and if we do allow the plant to, to get a little bit too big it's a bit harder to manage so we'll, we'll be plant mapping it with the internodes and if it does get a, above a threshold and that depends on a few things, depends on heat, moisture, like I said nutrition, if it does get above a certain area we'll, we'll then want to go through and pick it and slow it down mm. and keep it to a, a nice height like this. this plant size here is perfect you know it's compact it hasn't got heaps of laterals it's um and it's definitely got a heap of bowls through the center there that won't be too hard to pick so we're really happy about it it hasn't got heaps of rank growth or anything um and then i suppose at the end of the season when we are happy with the amount of fruit that we've got on then and the size and we we know we're running out of moisture and we're sort of 
running out of the heat units we need, we'll go ahead and cut it out. So we'll put a, a rate of picks there that will stop any of this sort of regrowth from coming through. So we'll put a rate of, yeah, something close to something above a 100, 100 mils of RX380 or a litre of the old strength um, picks to completely pull it up. And so then is, is picks a, just a growth regulator or is it a a herbicide as such like what, what yeah it's it's uh, chemical name is mepiquot chloride um yeah it's just a growth regulator i suppose um i think it's it's naturally producing the plant to slow it down and speed uh, slow it down when it wants to be slowed down and we're just obviously like defoliating and and the other um things we do with the cotton crop we try to manage it as much as possible so mm. yeah we we use it to slow it down and then completely stop it at the end of the season, yeah. Because okay, I reckon they, if you had, if you kept having rain on these things, they'd um, they'd get as big as big oh, as you yeah. could imagine, and you're using all that nutrients and moisture yeah. going into bulk, not not uh, not cotton, which is not where and, you get your money. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the that's the question I suppose mm. you have with a stripper of a picker. Mm. Why are the one? Obviously the. The strippers are a bit cheaper to run sort of thing and definitely more focused for, towards your dryland crops mm. um, and your picker, yeah, a bit more expensive and, and that's part of the reason why we are picking it so we can keep this mm. compact plant that um, effectively grows a, a nice, yeah, a nice uh, bowl there that has high quality but isn't too big and too rank that we can't actually get a stripper to come mm. through and strip it and we, mm. we need to get a picker that costs more to yeah, come yeah. in and... And, and harvest it. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's we're using very interesting. it. interesting. Mm. <laughs> what have you found? I found my little mate. <laughs> I, think he, I think he turned up a bit late. <laughs> He's, uh, thanks, Cal, for that summary. This bloke, I think he might have sat there for a month or two <laughs> and then finally popped up and uh, the whole mob was already up and away. So he, um, I, I was just actually saying to Callum before, down the other end, in the poorer soil there, there was a real tiny little one. It was only... Oh, I don't know, maybe six inches tall, and yeah. it had one bowl on it. Yeah, I was like, man, he's having a go. It's, it's contributed. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> but it's like, how tough? Are, like, you know, how tough are they? They can be. They just always. That's their goal, isn't it? That's their purpose to just put put fruit there out and reproduce. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, go forth and multiply. Exactly. So, um, so, yeah, it's interesting what they'll do. We call it a woody weed. Once it gets over about eight leaves, it's it's it becomes a pretty hard plant, a hardy plant. Like it's tough. Mm, mm. You see the evidence around the around the district of, because it's been a wet summer and we've had a lot of cotton round, people trying to kill last year's cotton if they didn't <laughs> properly dig it out mm. has been quite hard. Well, even with the floods, actually, um, some cotton, like we've had in, I was just spraying oh, there, there was, in, there, was yeah. a, there was probably, what, half a dozen plants just randomly in the paddock. Yeah. And, um, yeah, like they've floods, missed... Pigs, emus. They've missed all the sprays so far, yeah. so they're, st <laughs> they're, they're still just there, but... Um, and the other thing, like Cal's talking about our cutout picks, which we did probably f a month ago or more, mm. but it, it eventually grows short, and that's what's happening mm. here. Mm. It's lost its apical dominance of these leaves, and it's just trying to grow back, so... Mm. We'll, uh, we'll hit it with some defoliant and pull it up. Yeah, good. Oh, thank you guys for that. That was, um... Yeah, well, I, I had no idea about half of that stuff. I've just been going off what... Brad tells me who's been, Brad's been the main one talking to Tony, so then I'm asking Brad what's going on, and he's br briefly telling me, but to hear it from the horse's mouth as it's uh, as it were, is um, is really good, so thanks guys. Well, we're back and we are down here with the refuge cotton, um, which some, when we actually planted it in the video, um, for those that have been following along, um, I did very briefly and probably very badly explain what the refuge is, um, but what better time to actually get people that know what they're talking about to talk about it because it is very important, isn't it? So, um, yeah, Tony's back with us, so there's a grub. You found hey, one? Matty, yeah, the refuge is doing its job, mate. So that's a that's a grub. We've got loopers and healies. You can see another one sitting on top there. But a lot of grubs are just com almost completely defoliated this crop. So the whole idea of this, Matt, you can see this plant is one of our bulgard plants from up in the farm. It's loaded with probably, I don't know, I haven't counted them, but let's say there's 20 bowls on there, maybe a few more. That's where the money is in this crop, but we're not allowed to grow that unless we're growing some of this, which makes sense because this plant's got a couple of naturally occurring proteins in it, spliced into it, so it's a, it is a GMO plant. Um, 
the three proteins that are spliced in there are all proteins that kill lepidopteran, so all of our moth caterpillars, so Heliothus, lupus, and a whole lot more. Yep, there's your looper, the lynchworm. Um, and you can see here, where I've thrown that one, <laughs> the grub next to it is dead and juicy. Have a look at that. That's feral. So there's so many grubs in here, it's like a feedlot for grubs, and there's a virus has got into them, and he's spreading. You can see here again, you've got virus grub on that leaf, a live one there. <laughs> so there's so many here that's happening, but the whole point of this refuge is we don't want any grubs to survive on the bowl guard. If they do, when that moth, when that grub's pupated and then emerges as a moth, the last thing we want is for it to meet another moth that survived in the bowl guard and breed, because they'll both be resistant. So the whole idea of this refuge, and we've got to grow 5% of our area. Don't mind us swatting here, we've just got a bad mozzie problem. Bad so mozzies. Yeah, just... <laughs> you can tell we don't spray insecticide there, yeah, mate. This is what, We everywhere. thought it was bad over there, but it's worse here. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. No, you're right, mate. So um, we grow 5% of the area of the crop to refuge. We let the grubs go mad in here, so it's pretty well a sacrifice crop. We don't expect to pick it. Sometimes we do. There is no fruit on here. There's just a couple of wrinkly old bowls, and that's it that we won't bother picking. And that's meant to be a leaf. <laughs> that's meant to be a leaf. <laughs> It's a skeleton of a leaf. <laughs> yeah. And the whole idea is that we want 5,000 or 20,000 moths to emerge from pupae here and fly across and completely confuse those two moths that emerge in there if they do, so that they do not meet. So we're diluting the chance of those two moths, if they survive in the bowl guard, meeting. So that's our resistance management program. So there's other things that we do, like pupae bust the ground to make sure the pupae aren't, don't survive if they're in the ground. We pupae bust. I was going to try and find your pupae. So these loopers will actually pupate up in the crop, uh, whereas the healies are always pupating down in the soil. Uh, but quite a few of these, when we are walking through here before, you could see there were pupae up in the crop. You got, got one, one, Cal? Callum's got one. Oh, yeah. So they just wrap themselves up in a leaf, eh? Yeah, creating, and a, creating cocoon, a little of a cocoon. Yeah, and... yeah right. Yeah, got a few here, yeah. There's another one. There's something in it. Yeah, he's wiggling. See? Yeah, right. Mm. Yes. Good job. So well, that's, that's a, a, that's a that's, massive difference, that's isn't it? That's live action right there. <laughs> there are a few bowls in here, you can see. They yeah, would have yeah. been set early. But just to give you an idea, from 1998, which is when I first started checking cotton, we were spraying 10 to 15 times a season with some fairly nasty chemistry to protect the cotton crop to get it through to yield. Um, in the time from then till now, the industry has reduced its insecticide use by 98%. Yeah, well, that's uh, what I just remember. A massive reduction. Well, that would have been about the time when we last grew it. Yeah, somewhere mid around 90s. And um, I just remember, yeah, Dad. Yeah, it was a very high maintenance crop. You couldn't leave it for more than a, a uh, week or two, and you just were always doing something with it. And um, yeah, it just gets a bit, makes it high risk when you've got to put a lot of inputs into it and you don't know what you're going to get really. Yeah, so Yeah, those crops, we were checking them three times a week. Mm. So you could have got them through to. The green bowl stage that you got over there, like mm. we could have got it through to there with 10, 10 or twelve sprays, mm. and still lost control with with uh, grubs and ended up with a, a crop mm. that would still be better than that, but not a lot better, you know. Yeah, and then you know it might have been a crop your money like back. that. <laughs> you got and once you start it, you got to yeah. Once you start spraying chemical on it, you got to keep you had to keep doing it to protect it. All that money's gone, so mm. that's that's reduced our inputs massively from an insecticide point of view. The Roundup Ready gene has reduced our herbicide inputs quite a bit, but we still have to be very careful to be good stewards of that product and make sure that we use other modes of action as well to control our weeds. So you can see through here, it's a, it is a really clean paddock. Um, it's had a, three different actives at, at planting and at residual time, so when it was planted, and then it's had another two or three actives over the top just to... Not that often, I think we've been over it twice maybe to spray grass, uh, once for myriads I think, um, from memory. Yeah, I, I think Brad did both of them, or he's, I don't think I've sprayed this other than the weed it when we're putting on that fur. 
Yeah, that, was, the a, weight. that was a tricky little way to do it. So we put a foliar fert on and, and just used the camera and so it only activated on green leaves. It was 30%. through that. 30% was the good was saving. What it was, so mm. yeah. Right, eh? Well, that's it, eh? Very interesting. That's the crop, mate. Well, thanks again, guys. That was very interesting and it's good to clear that up. I sort of half knew what the refuge was for, but that um, that's good. That is very good. So anyway, guys, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, just write them in the comments and I'll either do my best to make it up or I'll um, send Tony a text and see if I can get him to, to answer it a bit more intelligently. So um, anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again. We'll catch you in the next one.